Hi, I'm here with Dr. Justin Ram. He is the Director of Economics at the Caribbean Development Bank. Hi, Dr. Ram. Hello, Kalila. Uh, good to chat with you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for being here at the Caribbean Development Bank's annual meeting. Of course. So I wanted to talk to you about some of the CDB's policies, some of the things that have been discussed over the past couple of days, particularly the focus on technology and developing small businesses. Sure. So let's start with the, the business side of things. I heard Dr. Smith, the CDB president, mention that the CDB wants to support uh, the creation of junior stock exchanges around the region. Tell me some more about what led to that idea. Well, that's quite simple. It's simply because we understand that if you want to get investors to invest in micro, small and medium sized enterprises, that they must have a, a means of exiting that business after they have possibly recouped their investment. And what we have realized is that one of the best ways to get angel investors and perhaps venture capitalists to invest in small businesses is that if you have a stock exchange and when the business starts going well, you can then list it on the business and that gives them an opportunity to exit the business. So we see the creations of, of, of junior stock exchange of doing a number of things. One, it allows small, medium size and, 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 and micro enterprises to gain investment at a critical time in their development. Why do we say that? because really when businesses are now taking off, they don't want to be saddled with debt. Mm -hmm. that, can, that can actually kill a business very, very quickly. What businesses need at that time is really for investment. And so we think if we are going to grow angel investing or for example, venture capitalists, if investors are going to invest in a business, they need to be able to exit and the junior stock exchange allows them, allows them to do that. It also is a good opportunity for businesses to say, hey, here, to, to the world, here's my business. I'm doing well. Why not come and invest and be part of this journey with me? Mm -hmm. So we think that the creation of junior stock exchanges is, is, a, is, is, is a really positive thing. Jamaica has probably done this uh, the best amongst our board member countries. And we think that that model can be replicated across. I know that recently Jamaica has also been thinking about setting up a a micro yes. stock exchange, yes. so which is even better for very, very small firms. So take, for example, if you want to invest in a very small firm, it might mean that you have a number of people who might want to put in um, small investments that will, and together create one large investment for that firm. Well, with the creation of a micro stock exchange, it means that more people can, can do that. And really it gives citizens an opportunity to own um, the, the, the growth, the growth sectors of, of, of an economy because MSMEs really account for a significant proportion of our GDP as well as our national employment. Yeah, but how realistic is it though, especially for some of the smaller states that don't even have a regular stock exchange yet to want to now branch out into a junior stock exchange? Wouldn't it be better to perhaps support the development of a regional stock exchange? Well, I'm really happy you mentioned that. Um, and we have had stock exchanges across the region. As you know, there's a stock exchange in Trinidad, Barbados, Eastern Caribbean, and Jamaica. Right. And Jamaica is probably the most successful of them because there's a lot of securities that are, that are traded there. But I think you've hit the nail on the head there. If we could have a sort of a regional stock exchange, that means it is, you're going to have the economies of scale that, that come with having more securities traded on a, on a regional platform. And there perhaps you might have more investors who are looking at opportunities to invest in small businesses. So take for example, if I am operating a business in Dominica and investors there don't really have the appetite to invest in my company, mm -hmm. someone in Trinidad might have the appetite. True. And so if you have a regional stock exchange, then you have the opportunity to get investments from across the region. Mm -hmm. So I think you've hit the nail on the head there. So we have to think it through, the policy. Maybe there needs to be some sort of arms of the various regional stock exchange operating in each of the territories. But I think certainly a regional approach um, is, 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 is an approach that we must consider. Because mm -hmm. there is some cross-listing, like some Jamaican companies listed on the TTSC, some yes. Trinidad companies listed on the JSC. Yes. But, but it, there's room to go there, a whole lot further. Exactly, there's a room for that to grow. And, and you know, companies really need to have their listings where a multi 
a lot of investors have the opportunity to invest. So take, for example, in the US, the New York Stock Exchange. Um, you have people from all across the US and across the world who can invest in the New York Stock Exchange. That's what I think we want to encourage um, within, within our region. First, allowing nationals and regional people to invest in our own companies. And then perhaps eventually as these companies grow and get larger, then, we, then they might be attractive for international investors. Mm -hmm. So I think our vision really has to be quite big and thinking way into the future about what's the potential by taking these first initial steps. And that's what I think Dr. Smith was trying to advocate for um, today in his in his remarks to our governors. Mm -hmm. But you know, the wholeness administration in Jamaica has taken this policy approach of socializing wealth. That's their new buzz phrase. And you may have heard of the Wigton Wind Farm IPO as well, 32,000 Jamaicans participating in, in it, right. the largest ever. What are your thoughts on this kind of idea of socializing wealth via the stock exchange and using that to divest government assets? Yeah. I think it's a brilliant idea, um, and it's one that a number of governments have, have, have actually done. In fact, it's a good way of sort of a public-private partnership. So if, for example, you had the Wigton Farm, which probably required, first of all, some government in, in investment to get it off of the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe a private sector investor may not have looked at that um, with great eagerness and willingness to invest initially. But with the government making that investment and getting it off the ground, and now it's profitable. Mm -hmm. And now you can say, well, why not allow the population to be part of this wealth creation, to own a part of the economy? I think that is great because we really need to encourage the ordinary citizens, and, and, that, and that includes you and I, to own a bit of the um, economic activity of our countries. It means that now we have a vested interest. We want to see our, our, our economy grow because then our investment grows as well. I think from that point of view, it's a wonderful initiative which needs to be replicated across. I know that, for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, they have done that with some strategic assets that the government would have owned, that those assets would have also been listed on the stock exchange to encourage oh. people to, to to own. I wasn't aware of that. That yes. was recent or a while ago? It has been happening for a, for a number of years and, 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 and they have probably also taken a different approach via a unit trust corporation. So whereby that, that corporation would have bought the shares of these entities and then people can then invest and buy shares of that unit trust corporation mm -hmm. and thereby they then now begin to own. It's a really a, a good way to encourage people to invest. And it means that people now have that vested interest in wanting this economy to grow. Mm -hmm. Because growth is really what will, will, will set them up later on in life, you know, in, in, improve their pensions so that, that, so that they can live more comfortably, let's say, in the later years of their own life. Mm -hmm. yeah? Or even pay for, for university education for their children because they have an investment where their money has been working for them rather than them only working for money. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, another theme that has come up over the past couple of days and that the CDB seems intent on focusing on is transforming the Caribbean into a digital society. And of course, in the discussion, Jamaica's national identification system came up and, and the challenges that have existed with that. Uh, what are your thoughts on how we can achieve uh, or the benefits, first of all, of having that type of national ID and how we can achieve that across the region? Well, the benefits are tremendous. Um, we heard from our William DeMas lecturer on Tuesday night about what Estonia managed to do. Mm -hmm. And the first building block is that national ID system, whereby every citizen has a unique ID code. And that ID code, you know, they, they don't have a problem with that ID code being public information because it's almost like a, a digital um, replication, Maybe. like a name, yeah. exactly. And, and that ID code tells you your date of birth, whether you're male or, or female, and, uh, and, and whether you were the third person or the fourth person or the first person born on that day, on that year. So I think that's, that's what I think we need, to, we need to move towards. I heard the now, speaker saying Trinidad and Tobago already has this type of system. Yeah, so, so, so Trinidad and Tobago has a national ID system where you have a unique identification code, but it's not digital. Okay. And that's, so what I think he was alluding to was that Trinidad and Tobago, 
already has maybe the foundation, what they then need to do is now digitalize that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know, for example, in the Jamaica case, unfortunately, in, in, my, in, my, in my, my personal view is that, you know, it was, it was, it, it's probably hit a bit of a roadblock, mm -hmm. but I think it can be overcome. Now, take, for example, um, I think in the Jamaican case, there was an, an issue where the law was required for people to mandatory right. provide biometric information. Right. I think that that can be overcome quite easily by just making it voluntary. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are voluntary giving of your biometric information, and as you go along doing your activities, your day-to-day -day activities, you realize that, you know what, it's quite easy for me to do activities if my biometric information allows me to say, this is, I am Justin Ram, with this thumbprint, you know that, that, that this is me, rather than having to bring more forms of identification, I think that more and more people voluntarily will sign up to it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it needs to be such a hindrance if it, is, if, if it is not mandatory. I think once people start to see how easier their lives can become when they provide this information, because it will, it will, it will be secure, that more and more people will voluntarily sign up for it. But you still have that subset of people that want to remain below the radar. Well, and, 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 and that's okay. I mean, if, 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 if they want to is remain, it? if they want to remain below the radar. entire parallel economy, is it okay? Well, I don't think that's going to be really a parallel, parallel it, it economy. It is, in my opinion. I don't think, I don't think it is. I don't, I don't think it will be. Um, those people will probably still have a unique identification number. It just means that maybe some types of information that they don't want to um, give to the government right now. But I think that over time, trust will be built. And then those people will say, I'm going to provide that information voluntarily. Because like I say, for those who provide all of their information up front, they are likely to see a, a threefold, even fourfold improvement in their overall levels of productivity because by the ease of doing transactions within the economy via that new system. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about some developments in the Eastern Caribbean as well. I see where the ECCB is moving to develop its own digital currency, which will be the first one backed by a central bank in the world. How exciting is that? That's very exciting. Um, I think that Eastern Caribbean Central Bank should be commended for taking that leap and perhaps creating the first um, digital fiat currency. Um, digital, of course, holds so much potential to improve our overall levels of productivity. Now, particularly for us in the Caribbean, and particularly for us in the Eastern Caribbean. So Eastern Caribbean Central Bank really has the authority of the currency union in eight different territories. And those territories are all separated by water. Mm -hmm. So could you imagine how easy it would now be for you to do transactions with a person living in St. Kitts with one living in Solution, if by if you can just do that from the top of your phone, for example. And that's what the digital currency will allow. It will allow ease of payments. And I should say, perhaps at a lot lower cost than some of the payment systems that we currently have. So it becomes as easy as making a phone call. That's how easy it will be to transfer money between uh, various citizens in, in, in different territories within, within, within the Eastern Caribbean. So I think it's a real positive move that will bring overall improvement and productivity and significantly lower the cost of transactions as well. Yeah. So it's, and, and, and there are perhaps other monetary policy benefits that come with a digital currency, which I know probably I, I could talk for, night, for days about this, but it's, 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 it's a move in the right direction and, 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 and perhaps more of our countries will, will eventually move in that direction. You know, great potential for increasing regional trade, perhaps something that the wider CARICOM would want to look at, although they have the disadvantage of not having a centralized bank like the ECC. Yes, uh, well, you know, the, the good thing about these um, arrangements is that you probably don't need to have a, a centralized central bank to do it. So if the various central banks could come together uh -huh. and perhaps come to some arrangements as to how they're going to trade within their, with their own digital fiat currencies, I think, I, I think, I think this, that, that holds great potential for us. 
So that right now, rather than having to, every time, if I'm living in Barbados and I want to do a transaction with Jamaica, let's say I'm, I'm buying something from Jamaica, I receive the goods from, from Jamaica, now I have to make payment. Now what tends to happen, I might do it by Visa or a MasterCard, and that transaction has to be routed through the United States. Mm -hmm. a, a portion of that is, you know, has to be taken by the service providers for their, for their service. And so it's, it's costly. So think about it. If we're able to do that within the region at that level, then that can bring so much, so many savings for us. I think there's a real opportunity. We still have to put a bit of thought into how it's, how it's, how it's going to work. But I think if the central bank, uh, the authorities come together, we can, we can, we can figure this out. And in, and in fact, we've just set up a, a working group to look at a Caribbean settlements network that will allow the central banks to have some type of a swap arrangements to allow individuals and companies to do those types of transactions within the region. So we're looking at it. You know, as you gave that example of the, the data having to be routed through the United States, it occurred to me that it's also a parallel. Well, there's a parallel there with what happens with the trading of currencies across the region, because I in Jamaica ordinarily have to change my money to U.S. In fact, coming here to, to right. Trinidad, yes. I would change my Jamaican dollars to U.S. dollars right. and then come here to Trinidad and then maybe change some of that to Trini Trini, and then yeah. change it back to U.S. when I'm going back. So right. it's, it's one step that can be removed from that wheel yes. if we were to go completely digital. Yes, it, 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 it could. And, 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 you, and as you can imagine, every step of those transactions is a cost. Yeah, so you are, you are having to pay. And so if we can now remove some of those steps in the overall transaction for you, your costs actually decline significantly. But you know what's the great potential about this? It means that now you can say to yourself, I'm going to go to Trinidad a little more often because it's quite easy for me to, to, to do that. Or I'm going to go to Barbados or to St. Kitts. It means that it can have the potential of bringing us closer together as a people. And I think this is one thing we at the CDB have been advocating for. We need to consider how we move that regional integration movement forward. Mm -hmm. We've been speaking about it for a long time, the Caribbean single market and economy. We need to think about how we actually get our people to start having those uh, more regular interactions. And I think that the technology is now going to allow us to do that. Uh, it will allow us to say, hey, you want to go from Jamaica to, to Trinidad? Well, uh, you, you, you don't even have to go to the bank and get US, mm -hmm. US dollars to do that. You can just go, you have it on your phone, you can pay with your phone in Trinidad, and that transaction is settled rather than having to now change from Jamaica dollars to US dollars to TT dollars. Mm -hmm. And if you have excess TT dollars, you have to change it back to US right. and then to go back to Jamaica. Yeah. So it, 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 there, there, there are many transactions that are likely to be eliminated and which will make your life so much easier. And could you imagine for someone who's having to do that on a weekly basis? Oh my goodness. The traders. Uh-oh. Yeah. So, so you, could you imagine what it might be for them. If they are thinking about doing trades and they think, oh my, I have to go through all these steps in order to do intra-regional trade, I might as just trade with the US, for example, and get the US dollars. Mm -hmm. So I think there are real positive benefits to the move towards digitalization and use of technology. It has the potential to actually bring us closer together as a region as well. Before we wind up, let me ask you about the issue of access though, because all of this sounds great, but if half of our populations can't access the internet, then to what's the point? If, if half of them are still left in the dark, if there's still this digital divide. So what's the CDB doing in that regard to try to improve the access? Well, you know, I think when it comes to access, moving towards digital and technology is actually a great benefit. Because if you look at the data, in most of our countries, most of us have one or even more than one phone on, 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 on average. So if you're now going to be doing most of your financial transactions on that device, which you own, which a majority of people own, and in fact, there are more people who own phones than have bank accounts. Mm -hmm. So in fact, this is a way of actually improving financial inclusion. But are they, are they accessing the internet on those phones, the majority well, of people? I think I think I think the majority are well. At least we know that they have they have a device, right. and that they can access um, uh, the, the internet, and so therefore they have the potential to do these transactions. So take for example, 
if you are going to the market where they sell fresh produce by locally grown by by domestic farmers and you're going there and normally what you'd have to do is that you'd have to take cash and pay for those transactions because maybe the farmer may not have a point of sale uh, terminal for you to use your card for example now what does that mean that farmer now has to hold on to quite a lot of cash all day and then at the end of the day probably goes to a bank if they have a bank account to now deposit that cash now if you can go to that farmer and you are buying let's say two pounds of tomato and he gives you the price he simply gives you his code from his from his phone mm -hmm. you do yours and the transaction is immediately simple. simple doesn't have to hold much cash at the end of the day he doesn't have to go to a bank in order to deposit that and if he doesn't have a bank he doesn't have to take the risk of walking around with a lot of cash um, on, 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 on their personal selves. So there's a lot of real benefits. And I, and I think the lecturer, the William Dimas lecture on Tuesday night, really invited us to dream, mm -hmm. to dream about the vision, what about could what could be, yes. and to think about it. How can we make the lives of the ordinary citizen of our ordinary residents a lot easier. If they don't have to do some of the transactions that they have to do now, they don't have to stand in lines. I think technology really holds the, the promise for that. And I think it's critical for us to do it because unless we do it, then our people will be attracted to other places that are doing that. Because everybody wants to have a life that is a lot less burdensome. And so we need to make it a lot less burdensome here in the region. And I think the way to do that is by moving towards digital and utilization of technology. Thanks for talking to me, Dr. Ram. You're very welcome. Thank right. you.